My name is Caroline Hathorn-Thwaite. Uh, I did come in from Canada, so I am a little jet lagged, but not as, not as much as when I usually come from British Columbia. I came from uh, Toronto this time, only five hours out, not eight hours. <laughs> Coming from Vancouver is really a, a challenge. So just a shout out to my colleagues here, uh, Drew Paul and Sarah Gilbert, uh, doctoral students at UBC, but Drew, and Drew is also uh, uh, in the learning and technology at, uh, in, a, in California. Uh, Anatoly Gru is my co-PI. Uh, and you may wonder why I came all this way for uh, a conference in social media and higher education because our grant is learning analytics for the social media age and what we do is social media in higher education. So the, uh, an absolute perfect fit. Um, and the, the, at uh, Ryerson there is the social media lab, the social media lab dot t, uh, t uh, no dot, social media lab Toronto. So uh, please do look at that and uh, lots of interesting tools, wonderful tools to look at things. Not what I'm talking about today, but uh, I'm always, I can always talk about that later. Um, so uh, I, I think I have to use, here we go. All right. Um, this, this work sits in my general uh, interest in, and in my, uh, I'm trying to reclaim the word e-learning away from meaning the learning management system to actually signify this transformative movement for learning in the 21st century in a networked world. And still transformation, who learns what, from whom, where, and under what circumstances. Now that's a little bit of a side uh, issue to today, but it is, it is uh, move into the framing of the questions that are here, and that's blatant advertisement for the book that actually advertises that transformative movement. Um, so what the motivating questions, what we did was a survey, and this follows on extremely well from the last uh, last presentation. So we we wanted to know about social media use in higher education. Uh, with the grant, we had said the first thing we would do was find out what the scope of this uh, phenomenon was. So really, we want to know how are social media being used and integrated or otherwise slipping into university teaching? How prevalent is it? What are instructors doing with it? What motivates instructors to use social media in teaching? And what facilitators or barriers uh, exist? And uh, as for the others, uh, this presentation is, um, we're, we're writing it up now, we've got more to do, so uh, anything you see here, I can always uh, send slides. So one of the things we're trying to do is find out a theoretical background for this and what's the pedagogy that goes into it. And looking at the literature, and I'm embedded a lot in the internet research area, so the adoption of computer media to communication in general. And so f with that literature and uh, literature on learning theories, there seem to be three main reasons for uh, people to try and put social media into their classes. Uh, one is to expose students to practices of the expected future workplace. Uh, some of the thunderstorm presentations were really good about pointing out that kind of thing, both the future workplace and the future communication setting. Uh, there's the idea of extending the learn env learning environment to engage with sources and views that are outside the class, getting you know that blurred boundary, really breaking it down. And the third one, the much larger one, is promoting a collaborative approach to learning uh, that involves learning with others, building knowledge, uh, building communities, and increasing reflection in classes. Now this is all played out against this background of adoption of innovations, um, which uh, I think we heard some of that in the, the previous talk as well. So of these, where do I get this? Ex the experiential learning, uh, exposure practices comes with theories like uh, Dewey's idea of the lived experience. And again, really trying to connect learning activities to the real world practice. Um, the idea of social learning where observing practice is uh, a way to gain knowledge. And so we think of legitimate peripheral participation and also the role of lurkers. Um, and work, uh, many others, um, and myself as well, learning how to be a pr practitioner. Um, that's how to be a professional, how to be a member of a community, and how to build its knowledge base. And from uh, my perspective, is really you're learning how to be an e-learner, or you could say you're learning how to be a social media learner. Extending the learning environment, very much the network learning, uh, network learning conference next May, Lancaster. Uh, network Learning Conference, we, they've been working on this for a number of years on how to harness ICTs for teaching and learning, <laughs> really capitalizing on the use of ITs for making connections. Now, it's not just the teacher to the, the learner, but among the learners and with their communities. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, 
Michelle Kersmer, uh, talks about the advantages of the community embedded learners, that's your distance learners who are at a distance, they're in their own community, and the flow goes uh, between, uh, between locations, between organizations, and among members of the online classes. The more recent theory of connectivism, uh, championed at this point by George Siemens, this is the idea of learning for the digital age. If you haven't looked at George Siemens' uh, work, please do. Uh, it's making connections uh, not only with other people, so basically you're the, the center of your egocentric network of resources as well as of people in your network. Uh, very tied to the uh, network learning environments idea, personal learning networks. Promoting collaborative learning, tons on this, goes back a lot longer. Um, so again, this some of the ones we've just mentioned, uh, this collaborative learning, CSCL, CSCW, um, and my own social, my perspectives here are the social network analytic perspective. Again, that, that's a whole other series of talks, but please be feel free to ask. The thing that's important here for, for teachers is that the teacher is an important interactant. And you pick up both from Vygotsky's ideas, but also Garrison and Anderson's idea of teacher presence. Again, I presume a lot of people are familiar with Garrison and Anderson. Uh, if not, please uh, do, do look at that one too. Um, okay. So what did we do? Uh, we designed a questionnaire to gain information about general use, social media use and about the application in teaching. Two parts, one general, one about consider a class you, you've taught recently, what was your social media use uh, in that class? Um, actually, I should say that we asked, think about a class you did use social media in, what was the use there? So our final version uh, went public in March 2014 and with contributed contributions to October 2014 and we sent the list out to uh, a lot of um, personal lists we belong to a lot of conferences that are associated uh, so our, our sample is not uh, representative because how on earth do we know what the population is but uh, uh, we were looking for as many as people as we could uh, get to do it a little incentive there for them to win an iPad if they filled it in Responders, uh, we go with uh, 333 respondents uh, who answered enough to, to count uh, gender, age, country, 60% uh, uh, women aged mainly in the 25 to 40 year old age, primarily English speaking, not surprisingly our questionnaire was in English. Uh, disciplines, and this may do something with the samples compared to some of what the previous group said. Journalism, media studies, and communication disciplines, about 19% of the sample. Information science, 9, education, 8, etc. So we got a good variety of fields, good variety of countries, lots of, 1% you know, of lots of, of, of countries, but um, had they taught? Yes, we hope they had taught. Uh, surprisingly, 15 of them said they hadn't taught a class. Uh, we presume from that they were perhaps TAs in a class so I hadn't taught a course um, that they had been teaching or they were about to teach or they were just social media enthusiasts. Um, most of them, two, 200 of the 333 had read, uh, have taught 11 classes or, or more. Now I said there were two parts. The second part um, was considered more optional because it was qualitative answers and that is what I'm going to talk about more here. And there were 210 people who filled out the second part about <coughs> use, use of social media in one of their, their classes. So let's see what kind of pictures we got. Now, in the small print, <laughs> we have, we asked them, first of all, what were they using in general? So what we want specifically to say, we wanted to know if they were so using social networking, not Facebook or equivalent. We didn't want named brands. We wanted to know if they were using microblogging, not Twitter. Because one of our, uh, one of our uh, colleagues um, had, their, their unit had instituted an internal Twitter because of the things that were being said. It was a little protection for everybody. Um, uh, so they had it, their own kind of Twitter microblogging. So we got categories here. And if I read up for you, social networking sites, this is in order of, of use. You can see uh, 300 or 333 say they have used social networking sites. They consume them. But if we look here, we've got about 280 who've contributed as well. So the orange bars are contributions, the blue bars are have they used it. Uh, social networking, multimedia repositories such as YouTube and Flickr, document sharing, that's the Google Docs, wikis, microblogging, any kind of synchronous di discussion, things like Google Hangouts, blogs, I don't know how we managed to get rid of one single word there for that. 
uh, academic social networking, asynchronous discussion boards, presentation sharing, slide share, they're like academic bookmarking, so Tarot, Conatia, social bookmarking, delicious, double upon, uh, and then virtual worlds. And we can see that virtual worlds are the least used. We know they're a little bit more complicated for people to get to and a lot more to bring it in. Um, so what, um, then it's of those who were using those, what did they use in teaching? And so what we have here is of those, I mean, these are kind of hard to, s to interpret immediately, these, these slides. Uh, but what it, just looking at the numbers uh, on the way up here in the train, uh, what you can, you can tell from, what I can tell from these numbers is the green, which is their present use in teaching. Those who contri actually contribute to the sites are, are, u are using it in teaching twice, almost twice as frequently as those who just uh, consume. So more active users. Our whole profile suggests these are early adopters, that these people who are using social media in general and, and moving into it, uh, moving it into their teaching. This slide, again, perhaps a little hard to see. We asked about past, present, and future use. The reason for asking about future use is so that institutions know what to plan to help people with. So we're seeing uh, not a lot of difference, but for every case, the, the present is lower than the others because, of course, what you can use in one term isn't what you might have used in the past. But if we're looking at some of these uh, blogs by students, we expect them more, more in the future, microblogging more in the future. So if I was an administrator, I'd be looking at these and saying, okay, so I need to do a little bit more to help people do microblogging and blogging. Uh, we separated out students doing the blog themselves from a course blog. Again, people a bit more of that. Um, presentation sharing, obviously a little bit more in the future. So as they were writing up these, these papers, we're, we're trying to get a little bit more uh, interpretation of these as we go forward. Uh, one thing that's really interesting, and this is what really shows we're looking at the early adopters, is whether they're using that application inside the learning management system or outside. And you can see the only thing that's really inside is asynchronous discussion. So I think this is actually the one that sheds the most light on what institutional practice is going on and why this is a, an early adopting group tremendously outside the learning management system. So they're not, as a, they're not finding it or not using it within the actual learning management system itself. Now, the question is whether they want to, whether it's the outside that matters here is a question that we didn't ask, but I would ask again in the future. What is the most useful? Blogs, number one. Twitter, number two. YouTube, number three. Facebook, discussion or other forums. Uh, wikis, Google Docs, um, WordPress, sharing, document sharing, and the learning management system. Uh, Google Docs probably should go with the document sharing. WordPress goes up with blogs. So I would say blogs have been fairly good. And I, I know somebody talked about culture, mentioned cultural differences. Um, but I also think the academic business is important here. So if, if academia is a lot about writing papers, then perhaps always using a blog is the one that's most in sync with our, our learning practices and our teaching practices. But I can, I'll get input from you on that. <laughs> what I wanted to, to concentrate a bit more on now is these answers to how they were using the, uh, the tool. So I said, what was most popular? And then we asked, give a brief explanation of how you use it. And then in the second part of the questionnaire, consider one specific course and how, that should say, how have you used social media in that course? So what we did, with, we, we coded the answers to these questions, uh, two coders and then one to reconcile. And then we did a factor analysis of those codes to find out the clusters of uh, uh, arrays of, of reasons that go together to again relate back to those three uh, potential reasons for using social media that I mentioned at the beginning. This is one of these things where I didn't have enough time to make a shorter slide with fewer words, so you're getting a lot of words here. <laughs> I know. Um, so just look at the look at the the, the words in 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 bold. Uh, sharing content. Uh, that's, that's sharing content by the instructor to students and or 
arranged by the instructors to facilitate sharing by students. Now this is all from the instructor's perspective. We only had instructors. So what we're seeing here is the organizing principle that they're, they have in mind. So there's three of these that, are or that have two dimensions like that. Organizing for themselves or the course and, and <coughs> putting in a <coughs> process so that the students themselves can be organized. Uh, so sharing um, for instructor or students discussing, organizing, does it help organize the course? Sometimes a blog helps organize the course or is it a way for s to organize so that the students are more organized? Uh, reflective learning, uh, again one of our principles we hope we would find, peer interaction, it's, uh, supporting collaboration, reaching outside the classroom, learning about social media use through practice, Discovery, we thought that they would be discovering, using it to discover, you know, go search on YouTube for a video on something, um, either by the instructor or to help students discover, and then fostering the learning community, because we've spent a lot of time in e-learning trying to create learning communities. Let's hope they're still trying to do that. Okay, well, that's a lot of words, um, and this is a lot of bars. <laughs> so what is the most common, the same array across the bottom, sharing among the students. Putting, using social media to share among students is, th is the most uh, frequently noted. Uh, discussing is next. It was just an in vivo code that just came out discussing. We didn't you know, ha need anything more from that one. Sharing by instructor. Um, organizing for the instructor. Then we get our reflective learning and peer interaction here. Some collaboration, reaching outside the class. Learning through practice. Discovery by students. Organizing for students. Fostering the learning community, alas. It's so small. This is my life's been putting, making community. <laughs> <laughs> Discovery by instructor. They're not. That's not what they're using it for. So basically, they, they, it's right at, at that end. So there are 13, 13 factors, 13 codes here. We wanted to see if, if they hang together and we can get a more general principle about these codes. And then we hope we get to something simpler that we can hold on to. Uh, Factor analysis, uh, of course, I'm not asking you to look at the numbers here. I'm just proving that we did it. And <laughs> proving that they, uh, all of those 13, uh, they, they load on one and only factor except for the one on reflective learning. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And it loads on two, two factors. So if we're interpreting these, now again, didn't have time to make a, word with a slide with less words, uh, fewer words. They, they coalesce around these, these six six dimensions here. Um, so the first is facilitating collaboration. So, this, so doing some way to uh, enhance student learning behavior through uh, participation, interaction, reflection. Organizing for teaching, but before that is helping organize by the instructor to, uh, for course organizing, dissemination of content, etc. Reaching outside, yes, we got a reaching outside because that's that's. So if I was going to be using it, that would be the main point that we want to want to blur those boundaries and get out there. Now we've got another one that sounds just like the first one: facilitating engagement, enhancing student learning. But when we look at this factor, it's all about group interactions, and that's why we get the reflective learning in two places. We get it first for students to reflect themselves, and you get it again because it's reflection through the process of group work. So it's an interesting thing that what we get there is individual in factor one, group in factor four, and then we get community here. So we got three levels of engagement, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, the last one, discovery, we're kind of not quite sure what's going on here because there was a negative uh, loading and we're not quite sure how to interpret that. Our very cautious interpretation is that the instructor is looking for a locus of control that is either theirs or the students, but never both. So it's, it seems to be around that. But there's very few examples there, and it's something that I would want to explore um, in interviews at some point. OK. Um, because the last session talked about facilitators and barriers, I have two s very quick slides here, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, by facilitators, one of the questions we asked was, how do you stay informed? Um, being a social network person, I'm interested in how close people are to you, uh, who you learn from. So what we can see here is that the bulk of people are learning from mass media. So once again, we're looking like early adopters because there's nobody else in their circle to talk to about it. 
Next thing is friends. We look at friends. So good. Okay, so that's the, if this is the awareness stage of adoption, this is the persuasion stage. And then we say, okay, well, what is going on at the institution? So we have some people who are learning, learning or getting support from the institution. So what I did, I actually coded these, I coded for the thing that was closest to them. So um, if they said uh, friends, they might be doing the others, but if they said mass media, they're not doing the others. Yeah. Uh, barriers, last discussion was about, about barriers. Yes, we found time. Um, they don't have the time to learn, to add it to it, or to grade. Uh, there's still the uh, e-learning the e we gave up on, on trying to grade submissions a long time ago. Uh, the, I think the social media world has to remember to give up on grading. That's what, that's what, the, that's what peer interaction is about. That's how you manage it. But they, don't, they, they have difficulty learning how to effectively grade students uh, for contributions. A lot of worry about ethics. Um, question I asked this morning was about bringing in the advertisements. That's where th this comes from as well. Uh, student privacy, what, what they might say about things. Uh, a lot of the tools are, aren't as adequate as they would like. Uh, support, not necessarily adequate. Technological, institutional, and again the student last month, students don't want you in their social space. So a clashing of worlds. And the ability, um, either the students or the instructor have difficulty using. Uh, Pew Internet has some wonderful statistics on, on how, uh, you know, that really show that not every student is social media savvy. So, uh, wrapping up, did I get any support for these, these three uh, ideas about what was going on? Uh, yes, exposing students to practice, that one we got in one factor. Extending the learning environment, we got in this very difficult to interpret factor. Collaboration, uh, yep, we got that one in, as I said, at the three different levels, individual, group, and community. And then we got this other one, which I, I should have expected, but didn't, the organization for teaching. And the reason I should have expected it is because a number of years ago, I did a study of students, and yes, we had the same split. What was about getting the task done versus building community? And they're almost like two different dimensions. Uh, facilitators and motivators, high social media use, uh, mass media you suggests our early adopter profiles. So I'm going to wrap up there and, and as questions, but I'm going to leave some advertising up here for you. Uh, Social Media and Society Conference, still time for papers, uh, in London uh, in July. Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference, uh, past the due date, but it is in Edinburgh in April. And uh, I know the second edition of the Sage Handbook of E-Learning Research, including a chapter by two of our colleagues, uh, uh, Drew Pollan and Sarah Gilbert, on social media and learning.